오늘 우리가 볼 하나님의 말씀은 The message comes from Matthew 16, verse 13 to 20. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 20. Let's do a response reading. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Amen. Now let's all pray together to listen to the word. Pray for the overseer who is preaching the message that we can all have the calling of prayer. Let's all pray that the Holy Spirit will inspire us and that we can have the faith in Jesus. Let's cry out Jesus once and pray. God our Father, we thank you for blessing us with this very special time so that we can have the special burial, uh, burial lecture for the second time. As they have already finished Bear Academy and have read the Bible many times and have led their faith up for a long time, through these special lectures, let them actually have experiences of what they have learned. And we also pray for the souls who are not here yet, who are still on their way. Do not let them grow weary and do not uh, prevent all troubles, all hindrances. Though our church has listened to God's word, we didn't have a sense of calling and so we are in uh, a lot of difficulties and trouble. But we pray that we will all have the heart of repentance and that we can all kneel before the name Jesus and cry out to you, God. And we ask God that you help us, that you keep hold of us. For 50, 60 years, Shimon has uh, cried and prayed uh, to God for 10,000 liters. Let this be fulfilled, God. We pray that each one of us can all become spiritual mentors, spiritual leaders. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. 
When you come to listen to this very special lecture, don't just come once and then skip the next one and come another time. Although you have listened to all the lectures of the of Bear Academy, we are going through what is central, what is uh, very important. So please listen carefully so that you understand properly. I hear people saying, Amen, Amen. But I wonder why they are not able to receive the Word of God. Because they are not able to accept the Word of God. Some people, like today, who cause divisions in the church says, oh, we're not going to do Berea anymore. Berea is not everything. They are denying Berea. But what is Berea? Berea is about going back to the Bible, going back to the Word. If we don't go back to the Word, then what are we doing? So, our church members are in this situation right now because I... I actually, uh, may, I don't know if it's because I stopped teaching Bear Academy myself, um, but I'm not going to have any other opportunities after this. So I want this special lecture. When the, Around the time when the special lecture uh, finishes, maybe or maybe I will leave this world before I finish the special lectures. So this is like the final time I will ever give lectures. So please listen carefully. You have received grace. Do you think that you are spiritual as those who have received grace? People say, if you think that you have received grace, and if you think that you have, you are spiritual, you will definitely never fall into temptation. You will not fall into such temptations. Even in the Bible, it's, we see that there were many people who followed Jesus for many years, who saw his miraculous signs and listened to his words and were amazed. People were astonished by the uh, the amazing teachings of Jesus, but when Jesus said, uh, your forefathers ate manna that Moses gave in the wilderness, but the bread that I give you, but it is not like the bread that I give you. For I give you the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And then people wonder, what is this? Because actually Moses actually gave manna in the desert. But when Jesus said the bread from heaven, people wonder, what kind of bread is this? And so they thought it was actual bread that they could eat. But what did Jesus say? I am the bread. And then they, they thought, what is this? What is he talking about? So now he calls himself the bread, and then Jesus says, "You must eat my flesh to have eternal to have eternal life. You must drink my blood to have life." So they were absolutely shocked. How can a person give his flesh to us to eat? How can a person drink another person's blood? So they were absolutely shocked and said, "We cannot understand what you are saying. We can't understand what you are saying." And so they all left Jesus. They just left Jesus and never returned. It says in John chapter six, verse sixty onwards. And Jesus explained about that. The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. Eating bread and your flesh having energy and life is not actual life. Your spirit has to live in order for you to truly live and have life. So Jesus said, my words are spirit. My words, you must eat my words. Your spirit must eat my words for your spirit to live. So at the resurrection, it is not this flesh that de that has decayed into dust that comes back to life. It is the spirit that has eaten the word of God, that have drunk the blood of God. Our spirit soul will be transformed in an instant. So we will continuously learn, although we have already learned about this before. 
Because Jesus died and rose again, his flesh does not decay. He has the nail marks and he still has the mark where he was pierced on the side. And it is with the same body that he ascended to heaven. But for us, the resurrection of humanity, of humankind, we are going to have a body that we never had before. For Jesus, he just died and rose again. But for us, it is something that we didn't have. We will be transformed into a body that we never had before. The, the, the resurrection of the saints is a transformation. The Bible talks about the transformation. See, our spirit is invisible, yet our spirit will be transformed in an instant, and then our spirit will become flesh and bones. It will become a body. So we become a body, not the. F we are not a flesh. I'm not talking about physical flesh. Uh, I'm not talking about flesh made of dust. But we will become a body, and we will be taken up into heaven. So this is what we have to understand very carefully. The resurrection of the saints is a transformation. We will be transformed in a flash, as it says in the Book of Corinthians. <laughs> my spirit, our spirit that ate the word of God and that always had been sanctified by the blood of God, the spirit will be transformed into a body. Even though Pharisees were righteous, if they had, since they had nothing to do with the blood of Jesus, they will not uh, enter the resurrection of life. But even if you're a prostitute, if you relied on the blood of Jesus, then you ha will enter the resurrection of life. Jesus talked about this, he told the Pharisees, look at the prostitutes, they will enter heaven before you. So the power of the blood of Jesus is truly powerful. So please listen carefully to the message today. Don't just sit there and stare at me blank. You are not receiving grace by just sitting there. So please listen carefully. Whenever I do first lecture, second lecture, like the first day, second day, third day, I'm just going to number them as first, second, and third, just so that it's easy to remember. But it's a continuous, it's continuous. I'm just continuing from what I finished before. So if you missed any, or you, uh, then uh, listen, maybe find it on the internet and listen. Uh, find out which lecture you missed out and then listen but just make sure you know that this is a series it's a continuous lecture today we read the uh, passage of Matthew chapter 16 we need to have an understanding of this passage which we read Jesus went to the region of Caesarea Philippi now, at that time, people were not, people didn't despise Jesus or, or reject him because the people at that time had relied on the prophets for a long time. That's how they led their faith life. Starting from Moses, they had always followed the teachings of the prophets. So people thought Jesus is one of those prophets. But what we can find here is that when we talk about demons, we say that it's the spirit of the dead unbelievers. But then people argue, you know, how can the dead do anything? But even in this passage, it says even Elijah was dead and even John the Baptist had been beheaded. They are already dead people. But what did it say in Mark chapter 6 as well? What did King Herod say? I beheaded John, John the Baptist, but he has come alive and he's at work in him. So they also knew that there are the spirits of dead people at work. So even though Elijah had died a long time ago, his spirit is alive and he is at work in Jesus. That's what people were saying at that time. So when we say that demons are the spirits of dead unbelievers, this was something that even the Jewish, the, the Jews, the Jewish believers had actually knew. They knew, they believed 
that the spirits of even prophets could be at work inside the people of that time. That's why they said oh, he is one of the prophets. So these people believe that it was the spirit of the dead prophets at work in Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to understand now to go on to the next. If you don't understand this, you won't be able to understand the next. Even the Jews at this time and people in general, they, see, they are talking about righteous people, but they believe that this, the spirit of the dead righteous people were at work in people who, that were living. That's why King Herod said of Jesus uh, that uh, it is John the Baptist whom I beheaded uh, alive, I, I work in Jesus. That's what he thought Jesus was. So, to say that the spirit of the dead can go into another person was something that the people of the Jews, uh, the people in Israel, had actually all knew as a basic understanding. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please quickly explain to the person next to you. Hurry up and quickly explain it. Don't just ignore this. You have to understand this part carefully. When you become a spiritual leader and teach other people, you need to actually uh, have these basis. Otherwise, you're going to be called a heretic. Because people judge us according to their own ideas, we are heretics, but according to the Bible, they are heretics. It's because they have departed from the Bible that they call us heretics, but according to the Bible, am I a heretic or them? Because that's what the Bible says. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. People are trying so hard to deny this, but people are trying so hard to deny this, but let's have a look at Mark chapter 6. Verse 14, Mark 6, verse 14. King Herod heard about this for Jesus' name. Let's read it from verse 13. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. Herod was the king. He was the king at the time. And his father was a Roman in a very prominent position under uh, Pontius Pilate. So the, he's, the Herod is a son of such a Roman and his mother was a Jew. But as we have learned before, the Israelites, the Jews, they don't. They don't uh, always consider the genealogy or the, the lineage of their father. They always consider what what line their mother is from. So, if your mother is a Jew, then you are considered a Jew as well. If if your father, it doesn't matter what your father is. So, they consider that very. They consider that very important. Because the mother is a tutor for the child. The mother teaches a child language from the time that a child is born. 
She teaches her children language and the language of the Israelites is a law. So they te the, the mothers teach the law to their children. That's why the children are circumcised. And this is a parent's pledge saying that they are going to uh, raise their kids, raise their children with the law. They cut a bit of the flesh of the boy's genitals and this is a pledge before God saying I will raise his child with the law of God so they are promising God they are making a promise to God so the mother teaches language to a child habits and the law so she is a tutor she is a teacher to her child so receiving education, being taught by your Jewish mother is actually the faith of the Jews. It's, it's fundamental to the faith of the Jews. So, so for Herod, his mother was a Jew and Herod himself received the greatest the highest uh, kind of education. So in, in terms of faith, he learned about the law and the prophets from his mother and also by his Roman father, he received the best Roman education because he became a king. He was sent to be be king and so you can see that he was very knowledgeable and this is what he is saying so these are not ignorant people talking these are not talks of ignorant people he is a knowledgeable man and what did he say because people were casting out demons King Herod said that it was John the Baptist whom I had beheaded it's John the Baptist that I beheaded that is uh, alive and now at work in him. John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and so his miraculous powers are at work in him. So his officials and his officials are also not ignorant. They are all knowledgeable people. And what did his uh, officers say? They said, oh, don't worry, it's not John the Baptist, but it will po it's probably Elijah or one of the prophets. But you can see that Elijah is also dead, John the Baptist is also dead, and other prophets are all dead people. So it's the spirit of those uh, prophets that are working. If it's not John the Baptist that you killed at work. But then Herod says, no. He repeats himself again. No, it is John the man that I beheaded that has been raised from the dead. He said this because of fear. He was afraid, but he was so sure about it. So he was certain that the spirit of the dead can go inside another person and work inside. So this was a general common knowledge, general knowledge. And this was a shared knowledge of all people in the uh, among the Jews. Do you understand what I'm saying? No matter what people, certain people say, even if they argue, how can the dead be a demon? Persuade them. If they won't listen to you, then just don't even talk about it to them. But it says clearly in the Bible. Do you understand? But uh, but King, the King Herod also did it, couldn't say that it was a dead robber or the dead murderer that is now alive and at work in Jesus because Jesus was good, doing good works. He wasn't. He couldn't dare say that. He couldn't dare say that it was a, a spirit of an unbeliever at work in Jesus. He could only say that it was Elijah or the prophets or John the Baptist alive at work in him. Uh, there are people who keep staring blank at me. Don't look at me. Don't sit there blank. If you're going to sit there blank, instead say the Lord's Prayer ten times. So, 
So although they didn't know the spiritual world completely, they still knew about the spiritual world vaguely. And at that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Korean, it actually says, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord and Christ means the same thing. Though. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The word Christ means what? What is it? You know, it means anointed by God, anointed by God, sent by God. So we ordain deacons. And so there are there are only two offices in uh, Baptist churches, and it's the ordination of pastors and ordination of deacons. And it's because we didn't ordain deacons according to the Bible that we have all these problems in the church. But the Bible actually teaches us how we should ordain deacons and whom we should ordain. In First uh, Timothy chapter 3, it says that deacons have to be a role model in their family, to their children, and they should be respectable and have a... They should ha have a sound family. And it also says, he must not be a recent convert. Why? Because they can be, they can still be, uh, they can be easily be raged to anger and the devil can actually take that opportunity and bring trouble to the church. And thirdly, do not it cannot be an outsider. Even though they were a deacon in a, in a Presbyterian church for a long time, we cannot ordain them as a deacon or an elder in our church when they have come to our church. We can't do that. We don't know what they might have done or what might have happened in that old church that they were. So if they have come from another church from somewhere else, they should not be ordained as deacons straight away. So, so recent converts, young people who haven't believed for a long time, or people who have come from somewhere else who might have led their faith for a long time elsewhere, they shouldn't be ordained as deacons. So, you have to test what kind of person they are. So can you or somebody here tell what that person's family is like, what this person is like in the family? Only the pastor knows the saint's family situation because he has visited the families before. He can see whether the children are respectful to their parents, whether the parents are will take care of their family well. So only the pastor can actually discern whether this person is fit or not. In Yonsei Chungang uh, Church, people who do not give tithes are not actually considered saints of the church from the very beginning. So you can understand that people who don't give tithes cannot be ordained deacons. So it says in the Bible, test those people, test them, and then ordain them. It says, do not just casually ordain them. So only the pastor can do that. So it says that the pastor should test them. People might say, Oh, I want to be I want to be a member of this organization and that, but in the church they cannot do that. Only the pastor can nominate a certain person as someone who can serve the church, as someone who can support the church, can be for the church. So the pastor can nominate a person and can ask the rest of the congregation. Do you do you agree that this person will be supportive of the church's uh, work? And if you agree, then we appoint them as members of the board. That's what we did last week. And so that's what the Bible teaches us. And we have to follow this. So Christ means to be ordained or anointed, but today in the Baptist Church, the pastor gets anointed and the deacons get anointed. They get ordained. In the past, in the Old Testament time, prophets were anointed, 
priests were anointed. So the word Christ means anointed. That's what it means, that God anointed. What does it mean? It means God chose and anointed that person. So the Christ means God chose him and anointed him and sent him. So in First Corinthians, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, there are many works, but there is only one God. And there are many duties in the church. There are teachers, deacons. There are many duties, but what? One Lord. So there is only one. There are many gifts, but one Holy Spirit. So likewise, Lord, you are the Christ. When he confesses, when he, when he says, Lord, you are the Christ, Lord and Christ means the same thing. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what he confessed. And what did Jesus do? He was so overjoyed. What did he say? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you. You are blessed. When we say blessing, people think, oh, I don't have any blessings. I've seen actually people who argue that they are not blessed. I told them, you are a blessed person. And then he said, I, I don't have any blessing. No, you have been blessed. You've received grace, so you are blessed. Oh, no, I don't have any blessing. I've never been blessed. They deny this to the end. Why? Because this person is poor. They are arguing that they are not blessed. But that's not the case. The blessing is commanded by God. So in Numbers chapter 19 and Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 and verse 20 says God commanded a blessing. God commands blessings. So if you just accept the commandment that God gives, if you accept the blessing that God commands, accept that command, then it becomes a blessing. It becomes a blessing to you. The president appointed uh, as ministers uh, some people that we never expected. If somebody said, if, if a person nominated says, oh, no, I can't do it, then they can't become a minister. But if the president a president nominates a person and they say, accept it, then they become a minister. But if you still haven't been blessed, say amen. If you have been blessed, say amen. Yes, accept it, receive it in. You are blessed. You will be blessed. Where he says, blessed are you, it means you will be blessed. He commands blessings. But he says, son of Simon, son of Jonah, Bar Jonas. Simon, son of Jonah. Simon is originally Peter's name when that he was called when he was young. Now, I call myself Shimuan, which is very similar to Simon, but Shimuan is like a, uh, Simon is like a small pebble, the size of a small chestnut. So it's the name of a country boy. You know, the small rocks, the pebbles, you know, the very small pebbles, that's what Simon it means. That's what it means. That's what Simon means. So, Simon, blessed are you. You will be blessed, Simon. He's, he has commanded a blessing to him. Why? But what he said, Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. And that means son of Jonah, literally, son of Jonah. It means son of Jonah, literally. In other words, you're a disciple of Jonah. You're a disciple of Jonah. You are like Jonah. When you say Bar Jonah, it means you are like the son of Jonah. You are the son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. But Jonah was a man of a long time ago. So this means that Simon Peter was like John. But if you look at the Bible, John, Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 3 says that the word of God came to Jonah. It says that the word of God came to Jonah in chapter 3 verse 1 and also in chapter 1 verse 1. 
It says that the word of God came to Jonah and the blessing can only come when we receive the word of God, when we have received the word of God. So the word of God came to Jonah. The word of jo- the word of God came to Jonah. It's not God said so and so and so. It's the word of God came to Jonah. Let's go to John chapter ten, verse thirty-five. Through this special lecture, we have to learn this properly. There is no other chance. John chapter ten, chapter ten. Verse 39, verse 35, verse 35. He, he called them gods to whom the word of God came. And the scripture, oh, Jesus answered them. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. So our faith cannot go beyond the Bible. We cannot break the word of God, the word of the Bible. All of us. Our faith, we can't see God with our own eyes. We cannot see Jesus anymore with our own eyes. But what can definitely guarantee God to us is the Bible, the Word of God. So for thousands of years, the Bible has cannot be uh, distorted in any other way. So the scriptures cannot be the scripture cannot be broken. We cannot ignore the scripture. We cannot depart from the scripture. But the scripture says that those who receive the word of God are called God. The word of God came to Jonah. The word of God came to Jonah. Even Jesus said, "If you abide in my words, and you will be my true disciples. And if my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish." This is the word that came to me. These two verses came to me, and that's what made me to walk who I am today. So the word of God must come to us. So like Jonah, the word of God came to you. So those who receive the word of God are called gods. So when we talk about God, we're not talking about something invisible, some invisible creature. But it, it means that he became spiritual. Jesus is spiritual. He is divine. And we have all become spiritual. We have all become divine. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant about the spiritual things. Before, when you were Gentiles, you were led by idols. You were led by idols. We were all led by idols, too. So when we didn't believe in Jesus, you know, we should, we we got scared when we saw something, and we would even have shamanistic rituals as well. So we were led by idols and the ethics. Even being under a king, it's all religious, living under a king. So even the society is very religious. Having hierarchy, ranking, it's all religious. So we were led by these authorities in the world. We were influenced by them. But in verse 3, it says, in First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit, can say Jesus be cursed. They cannot know Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Without what? Without what? Yeah, without the Holy Spirit. So only the one who is led by the Holy Spirit is spiritual. Er, the one that received the word of God is spiritual. They are called gods. If you don't receive the word of God, you cannot be spiritual. You are not a spiritual person. If you are not spiritual, you cannot accept God's word. That's what it says here. Do you understand? So it says here, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man. It was not by man that it was revealed to you. It is by my Father in heaven. So listen carefully here. Listen carefully from now on. 
Let's read verse 17 all together. Let's read verse 17 together. Uh, 16 and 17. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Let me ask you, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, say Amen. You said Amen. Who revealed that to you? Say it louder. Who revealed this to you? Say it louder. Who told you this? What did you say? You have said well by saying it was God the Father. But when did he reveal that to you? What day? What time? What next to that mountain over there? Where? Where did he tell you? Where did he tell you? When did he tell you? So people think when they read this scripture verse that it says it was not revealed to you by man. So you, so this means, so what they think is, this means so there is not a teacher, a man, a teacher, a person who taught us, but it was God. So a person who prays a lot, they, they pretend as if they have faith and they say, I believe. And when somebody asks them, how do you know that Jesus is the Son of God? Oh, God revealed it to me. How? Because they were so touched in their heart and they were so excited and they could they suddenly started to believe because they were so moved in their heart. They think that this moving, this touching of their heart is the work of God. What did I tell you always? Emotions, feelings, ah, mysticism. What is it? Relying on feelings is superstition. It's mysticism. Mysticism is superstition. Relying on your feelings is that. If there are doctrines, then it becomes a religion. Without religions, there is superstition. So a high religion refers to the religion that has doctrines because it can become generalized. But if you look at Buddhism and other religions, it's all mysticism because it is all about one's feelings. So they say, oh, if we have met coincidentally, then it's a special uh, meeting. They just say whatever, but our faith life is not like that. Let me ask you once again. When your heart, when you when you pray and your heart is touched and moved, you, you, you really feel that Jesus is the Son of God and you confess, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. But how did you come to know that Jesus is the Son of God? Oh, God was at work inside me. God moved my heart. God touched my heart. There are people who say this. Raise your hand if you do that. Well, let me, then I'll, let me ask you. Otherwise, how did you come to know this? How did you know this? How did he speak to you through the Bible? So you feel like you think you know, but you can't answer me clearly, can you? You can't be certain. Of course, we see it in the Bible, but we have to understand this. As Peter said, as Jesus said to Peter, this was not revealed to you by a man, but my Father in heaven. When did God tell him this? As I told you last week, when Jesus was baptized and came out of the water, what did God say? Say it louder. This is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. Who said this? God. And also in Matthew chapter, let's read Matthew 17, verse 5. We are not just saying this out of our own heads. God said this clearly. It's not because God moved my heart. Don't follow your feelings. Don't rely on your feelings because that is mysticism. That's what's so risky. 
It's not that you believe because you feel like you can believe it. Let's read Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Let's read it together. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So it is God who said this. God. God said this himself. God said this and they heard what God said. So this was not revealed to you by another teacher. It was not revealed to you by a prophet. You didn't learn this from another prophet. It wasn't taught to you by your mother, not by, you, not by blood or anything else. Who taught this to them? God. Not God taught us this. So mankind came to know that Jesus is the Son of God because God Himself revealed this. This is my Son whom, with, whom I love with Him. I'm well pleased. It's not what somebody else said. It's not that other people said, oh, Jesus is the Son of God, that He became the Son of God. God Himself said from heaven that this is my Son. So it's whether I pray a lot or I pray a little, does this voice disappear or not? God said, this is my son whom I love with him, I'm well pleased. Now think about it, Jesus was a Nazarene at that time. Nazareth. Nazareth is a town that the prophets had never mentioned. There is one verse in a poem, like in a poem, that he will be called a Nazarene, but that only appears once. Nazareth was the most excluded town. It was a town full of uneducated people, the lowest of all. So it's hard to receive education in that town. There are no rich people. There are no noble people. So to say that Jesus is a Nazarene, if Jesus is a Nazarene, for people to say, oh, Jesus, he's from Nazareth, he's a Nazarene, means that they look down on them. Oh, he's a heretic. He's from that from that Tsongrak church. In the same same tone, they were saying, oh, he is from Nazareth, he's from he's a Nazarene. Now there, he was a carpenter. That's the kind of occupation he had. So his appearance wasn't that appealing either. And he was standing in the line at the Jordan River to be baptized with other people. Now, what was the role of John the Baptist? God revealed to John the Baptist that he, he will baptize Jesus and that the one upon whom the Holy Spirit comes is the one. So, he, for John, he needed to watch out who upon whom the Holy Spirit will come. And so he was baptizing a person after another, a person from Galilee, a person from Jerusalem, another person passing by. Then one person from Nazareth came. So this Nazarene was coming in line. And nobody knew until then. Now, after the person in front of Jesus was baptized and then Jesus stood there to be baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And that's when John saw that the, saw, saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him, John the Baptist was so shocked that he said, Lord, I should be baptized by you and do you come to me? And he knelt before Jesus. It would have been so touching, overwhelming. So John was born to baptize him and he lived and died for this. That's why he's called John the Baptist. 
And Jesus said, do it. And do, do it to fulfill righteousness. Doesn't mean to fulfill God's will, but it, it means to fulfill God's righteousness. And so, when Jesus was baptized there, God said, This is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. So whenever I think about this this moment, I'm overwhelmed that it, and I'm brought to tears. Why? Because Jesus would have been waiting in line with the rest of the people and nobody noticed him he, because he was just a Nazarene. Probably looking shabby and nobody would have been interested in him. But he just followed the line, followed the queue and John the Baptist was somebody that King Herod was even afraid of. But when Jesus stood in front of him, John the Baptist said, Lord, he was so amazed. Lord, how can you come to me to be baptized? But Jesus said, do it and fulfill God's righteousness. So baptism is God's righteousness. And when he was baptized, God said, This is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. So Jesus was from Nazareth. He was born from the body of a virgin and he had grown up in Nazareth for 30 years. He had nothing appealing about him, nothing attractive about him. There was nothing to desire about him. He's in Isaiah chapter 51. But of him, God said, This is my son, with whom I love, with him I'm more pleased. This is the one that will fulfill my will and please me. So today, because you pray a lot and you speak in tongues a lot, because you confess, Oh, yeah, I believe that Jesus said of God. Yes, I believe, I believe. And they force themselves to believe this. But when they fall into temptation, they say, oh, where's God? Where is He? But when people fall into temptation, they won't even give tithes. Tithes belong to God. Do not come empty-handed before me. Prepare it in advance and bring it before me. God said, there is something called monthly giving. Every month, do not come to me empty handed in Isaiah as well. I am not pleased. People think that there is no monthly offering mentioned in the Bible, but there is. Because, and God clearly said, do not come to me empty handed. So even monthly offering was not something made by, by us, by people. And all the offerings that we dedicated, that we promised to God, whatever we promised to God, we have to give. We should not delay because God is going to demand what we have promised God. People who don't give offering, God is going to demand it one day, and when God demands it, they will cry out, but it will be useless. So people say to me that I don't give tithes, because I don't write it on an envelope, but from 1962, I determined that I would give the, the majority of my income. And I'm talking about 50-60% of my income. I determined myself to use 60 times, 60% of what I have. So that's why I've never actually written tithes on an envelope, but I've already given to God 60% of what I have, and that's what I've done. But people say to me, oh, he doesn't give tithes, and calls me a liar. Whatever they say, it doesn't matter. But if you don't give tithes, if you don't give to God what belongs to God, God will demand it one day. He will definitely demand it. That's what it says in the Bible. God will demand it. 
This is my son whom I love with him. I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So it's not because some your your heart is because you get so excited in your heart that you know that Jesus is the Son of God. Even if you fall into temptation, does the fact that He's the Son of God get erased? Who said this? God. So you can never not be erased. It cannot just because your faith has weakened. There is no such thing as faith being weakened or faith being good. It's a matter of whether you are obeying God or disobeying God. There is no such thing as good faith and bad faith. Because people don't, uh, people think, oh, it's because I don't have faith that I don't give tithes and I don't give thank offering. It's not because you don't have faith that you don't give offerings. You are rejecting God's word. You are disobeying God. That's why it's because of disobedience that people don't give offerings to God. So you have to understand this very carefully. You have mothers and fathers. Some of, so of course, some, for some of you, they might have passed away, but. Even if you're an unfilial son or daughter, so if somebody asks you, where is your father and do mother, you, you can point to where they are. When I was young, there was a really bad person. He was, he was always drunk and, and he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't even listen to his father. And he called his father what he, he used to... See, a long time ago, uh, old people used to smoke really long pipes. But then there was a pipe size about 20 centimeters, and that, that was in Korean called Gonde. So it was. Now, his father was. So if so, even for this unfilial son, he could even he can tell and he can say who his father is because his father is his father. In the same way, a person confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, but just because they fall in temptation, this fact doesn't change because it's not by their feelings that that Jesus is the Son of God. Nobody can deny that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why the Bible is so important. Let's look at Second Peter chapter one. That's why the Bible is so important. And Second Peter chapter one. Verse 15, verse 15 to 17, 15 to 17, 15 to 18, 15 to 18. Let's read it together. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with Him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and when we were with Him on the sacred mountain. So this has nothing to do with our feelings, our emotions. It's got nothing to do with your own will either. We can't deny this truth. So if I deny this, it means I don't, I won't believe this at all. So, it is by the teaching of God that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And if that, case, if that is the case, then we have to, we cannot but obey God. So what did Jesus say? God said, listen to Jesus, listen to Him. God said, hear Him. That's why, let's go to Matthew. That's why he said in Matthew chapter 28, 
Let's read Matthew chapter 28. What did God say to us to hear from Him? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And this is the commandment given to all believers. It has been commanded to all believers universally. So make disciples of all nations. So whoever it is, a believer has to make disciples. Everybody has to teach others. It's baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have to... Why, why do we need to make them get baptized? Baptism is about uniting with Christ. It's about being united with Christ. Baptism, that's what baptism is about. So to be united with Christ is baptism. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. And it also says in Colossians chapter 2. It's about unification. Let's all say it together. Baptism is about... Uniting with Christ in life and death. Say it louder. Who do we get united with? We get united with Christ. We become one with Christ and we die with Christ and we are alive with Christ. We are one with Him in death and life. That's what baptism is. You have been baptized and you made that promise. But did you really die with the Lord and are you really living with the Lord? You are not. You are lying. I, Kim Gidong is not a special man. I just believe in the Bible and I am doing my best so that I have life. But why wouldn't so many people do this? They have been baptized, yet they fall away. Even if they have been baptized, they ignore the church and they ignore the Lord. Baptism is about uniting with Jesus. And so the greatest, uh, one of the ideals of the Baptist Church is, a, is working together, cooperation, unification. And Jesus said, as I am one with the Father, Father, may they be one with us. And this is to fulfill the scriptures. He said in John chapter 17, verse 11 to 12, it's about becoming one. Lead your faith life properly. What did he say in Second Peter? Second Peter chapter one, verse nineteen to twenty. Oh, two verse twenty-one. Second Peter chapter one, verse nineteen to twenty-one. Let's read it together. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own pro interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the scriptures are very important. The scriptures were never, uh, it, it didn't come about by one's own interpretation. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They saw and heard what they saw and heard, they are written in. So you should not ignore this or you should not interpret it on your own to your own advantage. You should not do that. You must not do that. So we have to, so what God is saying, the words he has, he's saying, what he said in the Jordan River and what he said on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have to receive the words of the Bible in the same way that he spoke. 
Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. Verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebelli rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation and said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on earth in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Now let's go to chapter 4, verse 1, verse 1 to 8. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on earth in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So we shouldn't talk about the past saying, oh, like in the past, a long time ago. All the word of God that we hear, the moment that we hear applies to us. The word that we hear now, in this moment that I'm listening to God's word, the word applies to me now. So it is not only the disciples who heard God's word back then. We have heard it today. We are today. We are listening to the word of God. So we are not listening to something old. We are not listening to something that was already used up 2,000 years ago. When we hear it today, when we hear it on this day called today, when we hear it at this time, it's new. We are hearing it anew every day. When a baby drinks a mother's milk, does the baby get get fed with old milk? Just because my brother, all my older brother ate milk before me doesn't mean that I get old milk. No. In the same way, when I listen to the Word of God today, right now, do not harden your hearts. Jesus is the Son of God. This has been revealed to us not by my own feelings or by the pastor. When I went to a crusade in the mountains once, I, I gathered about... I was a, the, the lecturer or the seminar pastor. 
and there were 50 pastors gathered together so I told them, how do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? He said, they all said it was because they prayed so hard and because it was so touching their hearts and this faith suddenly emerged from their hearts. None of them said that God revealed it to them. Even if you don't, have, even if you don't twist your arms and squeeze it out of your heart, God already spoke this. Even if you don't believe it yourself, God already spoke this. So the question is, are you going to receive this word or not? You can't despise, you can't ignore these words. When I first came to believe in Jesus, I went to uh, my to get my hair cut. And I was constantly saying, oh, Lord, 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 Lord. I was saying this the whole time. And then he, so the, the barber said to me, you believe in Jesus? And I said, yes. Oh, have you seen Jesus? And I was a bit... I was a little bit uh, startled and I said, yes. And then he said, what does he look like? And then, and then I said, oh, well, at least he looks better than you because his face was... He had all these spots on his face. But I was actually quite scared because he was shaving me and he could just slip my neck right there. But then after he finished shaving me, he said, well, you go on and believe in Jesus. <laughs> but because I said that Jesus looked better than uh, him, his face, I was a bit scared because he was shaving my face. But then from then on, I thought, I prayed. I thought that I had to pray a lot to meet God. And I felt like I had forgotten God. So I kept praying, God help me not to forget you. I felt as though if I don't pray, then I will forget. That's why I went to Friday night prayers and I said, God, let me not forget you. Let me not forget you. But when I was touched by the Holy Spirit, when I was moved by the Holy Spirit, I realized, oh, it is not me that I came to know you. I was not by somebody else that I came to know this. It is not by my 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 family or anyone else, but it was God the Father who revealed this to me. Who? God the Father revealed this to me. You and I are listening to the word that God the Father has told, and we are obeying the words of God the Father. We are learning that. We are teaching that as well. So, do you understand what I'm saying? It's fine if you cannot pray and you don't have power, but right now, it is not by, it is not like mysticism that it is by your feelings that you know Jesus as the Son of God. How do you know this? Only by God the Father. Let's all say it together. Jesus, a God taught me that Jesus is the Son of God. God taught me this. God taught me this. Let's, uh, let me ask you first. Jesus, when I say Jesus is the Son of God, you say, God taught me this. Jesus is the Son of God. God taught me this. Jesus is the Son of God. God taught me this. Jesus is the Son of God and God taught me this. So if you ignore the Bible, the Bible was not written by man's own ideas and interpretation. They heard and received from God and they have written it. So you should not interpret it on your own. Do not interpret it based on your own ideas. This is as God revealed and so you have to believe the Bible as it is. Now, when God spoke himself, accept it as true. Only those who have received the word of God are called God. They are spiritual. So let's all say together, Lord, let me be spiritual. Hold your the hand tightly and say it together, Oh my soul, be spiritual. 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 How can you be spiritual? You have to receive the word of God. The scriptures cannot be broken. The Bible says you cannot be spiritual without the word of God. Who is a spiritual person who receives the word of God? Oh my soul, receive the word of God. Oh my soul, receive the word of God and be spiritual. Let's all pray together.